Hey everybody, I am here with one of my favorite pitchers to watch, Lucas Litke. What is up, Lucas? Hey, how you doing? I appreciate you having me. Big fan. Oh, well, awesome. I'm a big fan of yours. I mean, you make hitters look like they have to poop themselves sometimes, which is one of my favorite things. And I, I assume it's one of yours too. Like, do you ever feel bad for some of these guys? Uh, no, I mean, they don't feel bad if they hit a home run off me. So, you know, it's just is what it is. It makes for a good highlight. And uh, I'm glad it's on the internet so I can show my kids one day. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, like you've had some of uh, like at least two of my best highlights all season getting, I think it was Devers just ducking away out of, out of a pitch. I'm um, in Tapia as well. Um, actually that was, that was, that at bat was insane. Did you, do you feel that? Like when you throw that pitch you're like, man, that was nasty. Or is it just like, you know, you're competing. Uh, sometimes whenever I throw the pitch, I know where I'm starting it at. Uh, so if I'm starting it right at the left, like I'm aiming at the left hander's shoulder to head on my slider. So I know if it starts there properly, I have a good chance of that. So it's definitely in my head. And whenever it does happen, it's kind of like a, you know, fist pump in your head. Like I did it, you know, I executed what I wanted. So, uh, I know there's a possibility. I wish I knew the hitters. Like, yeah, I got to do it to one of my good friends last year, Seeger. And so that like little bit of like, uh, I could talk crap to him later. It's way more fun. It, it, it is one of my favorite things. Like there's nothing better than a highlight with that. I mean, I can't imagine there's a better feeling than actually throwing it. Like I get excited for you when, when I see the, the highlight of it. Um, and to do it has got to be slightly better maybe. Yeah, it is. Uh, you always hope like it ends the inning so you can really enjoy it. Because I mean, if you do it on the first pitch, you still have to execute. So you can't like, take yourself out of the moment. So the times where you in an inning on that, like there's nothing better. So I have come up with this theory that if you make a hitter bail or fall down or something earlier in the at bat, they should just end the at bat. It should be like a TKO in boxing or something like that. You just stop the fight, stop the at bat. It's over. You know, I could be the judge of it or let the umps do it. <laughs> I mean, you never know the way <laughs> the rules are changing every year. It might happen soon. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what do you think about the rule change? Like someone like you, I'm thinking robo umps would be insane. Like that would make you that much nastier because all you have to do is clip a tiny bit of the zone with those pitches. You can go up, down corners. Like, have you thought about that? Uh, yeah, we talked about it. We just don't know whether it'd be just a clip of the zone or 50% of the ball over the zone. Uh, I think it would benefit pitchers in the up down part of the zone, but in and out, I think, hitters would have the advantage you won't get. I think we get more calls off the plate right now and we wouldn't get them later. So that would be the adjustment. Like the fastball up or the breaking ball up, you'd get a, way more strikes. Uh, but the ones off the corner, you know, it just wouldn't happen anymore. I see some umpires adjusting to the high strike with breaking balls. And I think that is the future of the game. Like we've been told throughout history that, that that's a bad pitch. That's a hanger if you leave a pitch up. But now you have guys intentionally exploiting the upper parts of the zone, both with changeups and breaking balls. I mean, have you guys talked about that on the Yankees? Uh, yeah, we talk about it because you just start looking at the whole zone and how you can, uh, you know, a slider up and away is a way different pitch than a slider down and away. So you're throwing the same pitch, but it's, you know, different in, in sorts. Uh, so you try to work the whole zone if you can, you know, the way – pitchers think has changed throughout the years. Also fastballs up used to be, you know, a sin and now everybody does it. So uh, you just adjust with the game. You adjust the hitter swing, the hitter swings are starting to get the fastballs up. So I think you're going to start seeing more sinkers down again. You know, it's just who adjusts fast enough. Yeah, I totally agree. And the other thing sinkers were, they used to be in Vogue then they went out of Vogue and now you're seeing some cool tunneling effects um, with sinkers off the plate catching the zone and then a sweeper kind of taking you out of the zone. Um, so you're just finding new combinations of pitches, and I think you can never write off any of them, and filth will always be filth. Yeah, and they're figuring out how to make the ball move differently. Uh, like the guy on our team, you, you see him a lot, Clay Holmes. He doesn't have a traditional sinker spin. Uh, you know, when I first got drafted, if I threw a sinker like that, they would tell me it was completely wrong and need to pronate more and it's just technology has changed so you know the coaches are getting so good at just finding the way you release the ball and making the ball move however they want 
you make a really good point because I interviewed Devin Williams and, you know, he's got that airbender and he was told that that was a bad pitch because analytically when they were doing spin rates, it had too high a spin rate for a changeup. They yeah. wanted a low spin rate changeup. And I think it, that we're finding out that it's the unicorn pitches, the pitches that hitters don't see as much that are the filthy pitches because you can't prepare for them. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I think now it's getting to the point where if it works, it works, you know, it doesn't have to make logical baseball sense. Uh, you know, another example is Zach Britton. You know, I was talking to him about his sinker. When he learned it, he was trying to learn a cutter slider and it just started sinking. And luckily, even though it was a long time ago, luckily they just said, just do that. Because uh, some coaches in the past would say, no, you need to do this more to make it a cutter. Uh, so sometimes, you know, just the way you throw is different. And uh, that's the crazy thing about baseball. Everybody's unique. It is a weird thing. And I've heard this from multiple folks that sometimes like Logan Webb throws a sinker and when he throws a sinker slower, it cuts. So you have all these weird pitch movements that sometimes having that gyro spin on the ball, Stroh does that, Stroman does that too with his sinker. It creates this weird sink to a pitch that, uh, I mean, again, hitters aren't used to, and it also just looks weird. Like Zach yeah. Britton's one looks, looks weird off his hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. It's like watching a position player pitch when they throw a, a two seam, you know, it always ends up cutting. Uh, so I don't know, man. <laughs> it's just weird. Like that's what makes pitching great though. Yeah. Like you can literally just make something up and it might yeah. work. Might not. Yeah. So the Yankees are pretty big. On, like I know Matt Blake for a long time. Um, we were like in the same Twitter group early on when he was just like, coming up um, with Cressy and like he I mean I know he's a smart guy and he, he definitely sees things in a unique way what has it been like as far as y'all like on the Yankees you have a bunch of guys that he's done a great job or the team has done a great job cobbling folks together and, and pitching to your strengths but you also have adopted this whole sweeper thing or whatever Lindsay called it the whirly ball or the uh word yeah, yeah. Um, so, like, what is going on there? Like, what are, what are the Yankees about pitching wise? Uh, it's honestly, they just tell you what you're really, really good at and try to get you to buy into that. You know, when I got here, they said your fastball is great. Most people look at my fastball and say it's you know, 86 to 89. Yeah, probably shouldn't throw that. But they said your fastball is a glitch pitch. Like, we don't understand it, but hitters can't see it. And the analytics show you need to throw it a lot. Uh, and throw it down the middle like they told me just to throw strikes and so like just to do that they showed me the data and they said look just trust us and once I started buying into that you know it wasn't me avoiding the zone my fastball anymore because it was slow let me just attack hitters and see what happens that is an interesting point because I think team you know growing up you're always told you got to hit your spots you got to keep the ball down hit your spots and you'll be successful and it turns out that pitchers, a lot of teams, the, the Rays do this too, which is number one, go with your best stuff more often. Um, and two, throw your nasty stuff like anywhere in the zone. Um, as long as it's in the zone and you're pounding it, hitters are going to have a hard time with it. Don't be so fine with everything. And I think that's got to be a hard adjustment, right? It is. But I think this is where the analytics help is like when they start showing you your you know, hard hit data, your barrel percentage. And they're like, look how low yours is. You know, look at your hit. Like, especially at the beginning of the season, I was getting unlucky. I gave up a run like my first five or six outings. And they sat me down. They're like, don't change. Look how hard the ball's getting hit. Like they're hitting 80 miles an hour off you. It's like, like things will work out. And uh, just seeing that data is like, it takes you out of the ERA mode of like, what's my ERA? Right. I am getting weak contact. I am getting swing and misses. Just like pound the zone, trust the process. It's interesting because I think hitters go through that too, right? Like hitters, will, you'll hit a bunch of balls at somebody. You'll wake up and realize you're like, you're oh, for your last 20, but 10 of them were hard hits. And then they start, they used to start changing stuff and tinkering. Like, I, you know, I've got to hit it over the infielder. I got to hit it in the gap and set, and you start making adjustments. Then you go into a real slump. But if you yeah. have, the analytics to back it up, you can say, you know what? I've been unlucky. If I keep doing this over the long run, I'm going to be successful, regardless of my 
of the events that have happened. Yeah. And, and that's what, like I said, the Yankees have stressed. My agent has always stressed that he's like, just trust it. You know, things will turn because baseball is a game of inches. You see it so much one foot to left or right is the difference between two runs, you know, it could be a double play ball or it could be a single through the hole and then a rally starts. Uh, so it's just like control what you control and like, just don't overthink things. Is there anybody that, so you've, again, you have a great assortment of pitchers on the Yankees. Are, are there people that you sit there and just want to watch every time they're out there? Like you're going, Oh, I can't wait to see what, what this guy does when he's, when he's out there. Uh, I mean, me, it's Nestor because we're sort of similar where we are, but we aren't, uh, we throw the same type of pitches. So I will, a lot of it, every time he pitches against a team, I watch his whole outing just to see what he did. You know, we talk, we have lockers by each other. So we talk about it. Uh, so he's a guy I watch a lot and that that's for, because I like watching him pitch and it's also for personal advantage too, of to watch how he pitches people. He is one of those guys that it seems like fans just take to automatically too, just because he's creative, switches things up and doesn't necessarily, I mean, he did, I think he had, he hit 94 or something like that at one point this year, but he's not like a guy that's throwing upper nineties hundred and he's still like yesterday's immaculate inning. That was insane. Like he's, he's so much fun to watch. And I assume that the rest of y'all, I mean, I've seen y'all with the Nestor, nasty Nestor shirts and stuff like that. Uh, we love it. And it's the mustache too. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, they have little Mario characters on our shirts. Uh, no, I mean, to me, that's the guys I like to watch, like watch a 99. Oh, that's fun. But you know, that's a lot easier to do whenever, unless you're throwing like 89, like to be a true pitcher, a true artist, you know, of the game to get away with that for six or seven innings. Uh, so I enjoy that. That's to me, like the old school watching, Glav and Hermatix, uh pitch, you know, just a, a true craft. Yeah, I got you. The other, well, I mean, I also love watching like Araldus' splitter when you see that. Like, I don't think there's, I mean, that's a very, very unique pitch in the game, especially from a guy throwing 100, 102, whatever. And then he comes out with this thing that's almost like a knuckleball. Um, it, it really is. I watch him play catch every day. Uh, our poor bullpen catcher has to throw with him every day. And I don't know how he does it because just, Chapman's presence is intimidating and then you have a ball where you really don't know because it is at times it is a knuckleball I don't think it spins half the time yeah. uh so yeah I mean that's amazing Chapman himself is just amazing just look at him yeah I, I was at the all-star game and he was walking by and I'm like that is a big I don't think people realize it because number one baseball uniforms don't necessarily flatter folks uh but but he's gigantic like that is a big, big, intimidating, uh, dude. He seems like he's having fun out there as well. Like you'll, I mean, half those, st- those stare downs are like, he's smiling to himself. I can tell. Oh yeah. Oh, he's but th- last year when I got on this team between him, judge and Stanton, I was telling people, these are the three biggest human beings I've ever seen in my life. And I've been around football players. They just tower. They're like two of me and I'm not, I'm not small. They may be real small. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, – yeah, both of those guys are ginormous. And then you just add it like you're – the Yankees are not a team you want to get into a uh, bench-clearing brawl with. No, we got some big boys. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be messed up. So you've had a unique career arc, um, you know, coming back into the, into the major leagues after, after some time not there. What's that like? Like, what kept you going? Um, did you ever feel like you don't want to do it? Um, you know, what was, what, what was that like the struggle, um, and then to success now? Uh, you know, there's obviously times through that stretch where I, I questioned whether I should keep going or not. Uh, you know, I had the Tommy John in 17, so I missed a year and a half of baseball there. And then once I came back in 19 was one of my last years in the minor leagues, but you know, I, was an all-star. I, they sent me a double A. I was an all-star there and I went to trip and had a two something in Reno, which is pretty much impossible a lot of times. Uh, and then the next year was the COVID year outside, just in, Oakland had a dominating bullpen. Nobody got hurt. So to me, I was pitching good after my Tommy John. It was just, I haven't got that, you know, clear chance again to show it. And uh, honestly, last year going in the spring, 
you know, me and my wife had that conversation where it's like, hey, this might be it. Uh, let's just see how this year's go. And if I don't make it, then, you know, probably call it. Uh, so it, it is definitely, you know, thought about plenty of times because I, I have three kids, a wife. Uh, so at some point you have to like provide for your family. And minor league baseball is good, but it's not, it's not money for three kids. Right. Uh, so no, it's what kept me going is I felt like I was still good enough. I just needed my chance and I needed to prove to myself. Like, I felt like if I got to the big leagues, it would tell me whether I'm done or not. Does that make it even more sweeter though? Like now you have that experience, you know what it's like and to have success and, and as good a success as you are having, uh, it does that added perspective versus somebody that's just always been like, you know, they just make the jump, never have that, that blip. Um, I'm just curious of mindset. Uh, it, it makes me enjoy it more. Uh, you know, my first, I guess, little run in the big leagues, I, I was one of those guys I thought it was going to last forever. Everybody does, especially when you think, spend your first full year in the big leagues looking down, you know, I thought it was gonna be a 10 year vet, make millions of dollars uh reality struck quickly my second year i think i got to sit down within a week uh and then it just became a stressful time of being sent up and down whether i was gonna you know stay on the team or not or you know every time i pitched i was looking over my shoulder for the manager uh so now that i'm here i take every day like you know i go to the ballpark and have fun uh, i don't worry about pitching i don't worry if i give up runs or not like i don't want to give up runs but it's not gonna you know ruin my life if I give up run the big leagues because I was giving up run minor leagues for six years uh and that's way worse uh so it makes me just enjoy everything so much more that yeah that's that's awesome and I think that I mean it probably gives you maybe slows the game down a little bit for you too that experience yeah like I said it just doesn't you know it takes a little bit there's obviously still stress I still like get nervous stress about things but I've gotten better at just taking a deep breath, like when the game kind of speeds up on the mound and just look around the stadium and just realize where I'm at. And I was like, hey, you're a big leaguer. You know, these guys are big leaguers. Just have some fun. What other mental game stuff do you go through? Because obviously being in your position, um, you just you never know when you're going to be in the game. It's also usually a stressful situation. Like, I think the mental game is huge. And I was just wondering, like, what do you do to prepare for a game? What do you do when you're out there? What do you do to reset type of stuff? Uh, I'm kind of real big in the I Like, I do uh, at least a 10 to 20 minute meditation before the game, nap meditation. And a lot of it is just like self pumping myself up. Uh, you know, one of my good friends, Emmanuel Sanders, played in the NFL for a long time. He told me he started this and it like projected his career, just telling himself he's the best. So every day, you know, I do it at least 10 minute meditation and just tell myself like, Hey, you're a big leaguer. You're the best player out there. You know, nobody can touch you and just kind of pumping myself up. So I'm going into the game or the day just on a high note, as opposed to thinking, you know, sometimes, especially when guys are in like a rough stretch, they can just think the negative thoughts of like, Oh, I hope they don't call me in this tight ball game. I don't want to blow it. You know? So it's like going into it being positive as opposed to worrying about the negatives. Do you ever look back at your own highlights and say, you know, the, like visualize it? Are you sitting there, uh, you know, th thinking about like how this pitch shape would work with this hitter or is it just mostly just a positive thought overall? Uh, no, before I throw every pitch, I try to create the pitch shape in my head. Uh, so whether it's a slider, curveball, like even sometimes when I throw a curveball, I think Kershaw curveball, you know, I, I kind of just play a, somebody who has a great pitch in my head and just imagine it real quickly and then throw. Uh, Cause I think if you put that visual out there, you know what your ball is going to do and just trust that it's going to happen. That, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I think more pitchers should probably take that seriously for, for years. It was thought, thought like, you know, all it is is a physical game. And I thought that there's a lot of people that get into analytics and I love analytics, like don't get me in technology. And I think that it's done so much for pitching and finding unique guys to cobble together a staff. But I think you get lost sometimes into thinking players are robots and that it's all about 
analytics and that are same person, all they have to do is do this and do that. And they're going to just, you know, you just push these buttons, but your people, everybody's a person like your team matters, your teammates matter, playing personality of a team matters, um, having the right guys around you as well as the right mindset on the bump. And I think that gets overlooked sometimes because we're so used to fantasy baseball and you pick these guys and put them together and, and the best numbers work, but the best numbers don't always work on a team. Yeah, no, you have to have an even balance. And um, I think that's why last year our bullpen was so successful. And I hope it continues this year as we, you know, we have different guys, uh, you know, we got like, just from the left-hand standpoint, we got Chappie, me and Wandy. Chappie's obviously the flamethrower. Wandy's got a great changeup. I'm more of the slider cutter guy, you know, so depending on what type of hitter we have coming up, we can go different ways uh, because some lefties, left on left, they're good at sliders. Uh, so that's where we got Wandy. You can run it in on them, you know? So uh, I think having the same mold can hurt teams because everybody, you know, I watch a lot of the internet pitching stuff and it's great. Everybody wants to throw a million miles an hour, no matter where it is. And that works to an extent until it doesn't. Uh, so I, I think having an even balance of guys is, uh, is great. I think it's showing the fact that there's more than one way to get it done. And you're right. I think throwing hard is sexy. Like everybody wants to see that, you know, that, that 103 mile an hour fastball and, you know, that draws the crowd, but so does having ridiculous movement on your breaking stuff too. And you have, I think last I checked the most movement of any pitcher on his slider, most horizontal break on a slider in the major leagues. Does that I, sound right to you? I don't know. I know it moves a lot. And uh, it was honestly a pitch that was hard for me to, to get this off season. Cause uh, at the end of the season, I, I went through a bullpen in Tampa after the year was over and uh, just to kind of, you know, get a base for what to work on. And we talked about a new slider, you know, the Whirly. Uh, and then the lockout happened. So I was kind of on my own trying to learn this pitch that really didn't work for like two months this off season. Uh, and luckily, like before the lockout, the Yankees sent me some baseballs with markings on it to show me like, hey, the markings need to be here whenever you throw it. Uh, so the whole off season, I was like in a fight with my mind, whether to bang the new slider, because, you know, I was just, I felt like I was wasting my time with it or keep working on it. And then luckily one night I just went in the batting cage by myself and I just threw, I threw sliders for like an hour and a half and it finally clicked, you know, just doing one thing. Uh, so yeah, I'm glad I stuck with it, but I, I literally almost gave up on it this off season because there was no communication. Like, I didn't have any feedback of what I was doing wrong. I couldn't send video to anybody. Uh, so it's pretty frustrating. You could have called me up. I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. Like, so they actually sent you a baseball with like the, where your finger should be on the pitch when you release it or what was the, uh, no, they draw really big black dots on two sides of the ball. And they're like, when you throw it, you need to see a see black the dot here and here uh, to get the, the correct spin. And I just wouldn't get it. I was getting the gyro, you know, the bullet traditional slider. Um, and so, like I said, but it was just, you know, me and myself. I had another Hayden Wisniewski. I work out with another Yankees guy who kind of throws it. He was helping me, but his is a little bit different. Uh, so it was just like, you know, on your own. Well, the interesting thing is, so no matter what, you have a different arm slot than other guys and, and different. Everybody's different. So yeah the thought of they used to sell those baseballs with, you know, your, your have your hand here, the Roger Clemens ball, where you just do this and this, and this is where he throws a slider, but it, it depends on where your arm slot is. Everybody's finger shapes are different. Um, length of fingers are different so much. That is a much better way to teach it, which is this is what you should be seeing as the ball's rotating through the air. Yeah. Because you can like, they try to teach a lot of guys this pitch. You know, and a lot of guys throw it. For some reason, mine moves way more, and I think it's just the way I throw. Uh, you know, I don't hold it any different than most people, but, you know, mine gets a way bigger break than other guys do. Uh, so it's just kind of – then that's why they came to me with it. They said, we think the way you release the ball will work great, especially with the way you throw your curveball. They seem to be right because the movement on it is insane. 
Um, what is the most you've had horizontal movement wise? Do you know? Uh, I mean, I threw a bullpen. It was one was like 27 inches. Yeah. But it was also way slower. You know, I was throwing it like 70 miles an hour. Yeah. I just saw a, a Dick Mountains pitch and he had a 28. Um, but he throws it slow. So it's, you know, it's talking about like yeah. 66 miles an hour from that weird arm, arm slot. Um, I saw the, you had a couple you had around 23, which is, uh, I think you're averaging over 20, um, which is insane. Like that's, that's got to be so much fun to, to do, especially from a guy that hasn't been doing that for so long. Did you, when you finally got it, did you go like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be my pitch? I, I did. And that's why I, you know, I threw it a lot in spring training. Uh, not going to say I threw a lot of strikes with it because I'm trying to, I'm still strikes trying to. Strikes are irrelevant. Out. You know what? Like, <laughs> Yeah, but like when you when I'm used to my ball only moving like eight inches, right? All of a sudden it's moving twenty inches. It's like where do I start this pitch now? Especially to righties, you know, because there's not lefty. I have a, a person I can look at and throw it at. Righty, there's nobody over there. So uh, that's the hardest part, you know. When I talk to guys about starting a new pitch, I'm like, get movement down first. Just worry about that, and then we can worry about you know location later. Because if you try to do both, then you're kind of screwing yourself up. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you also, if you baby it, you lose the movement. Like if you're trying to throw it in the zone, you're going to lose that. And it's better to just find a spot to throw it at hard and be convicted in the pitch and get that movement and then dial it in, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, no. It, it Any pitch you baby, like you, you'll see it when a guy is not throwing strikes with his fastball. All of a sudden, he's trying to throw a dart up there, and it usually goes pretty bad. So you just got to let him rip. Yeah. The uh, Scherzer, I think, said that, it takes him like three, he'll, he'll introduce a pitch, but he doesn't really understand that pitch for like three years. Um, you've, you've done that pretty quick. So you've, you've brought it into the season really, really fast, but he like, won't, he, he has to figure out how it works with everything else and all that stuff. And he said, it takes three years. Uh, he's got a little more leeway on his time in the big leagues. Uh, <laughs> mine's either figure it out now or you're gone. So, uh, I think I spent a lot, Maybe a little bit more time throwing a few more sliders than what I was supposed to this off season, but I knew I need to figure it out. So that's I didn't realize the effect the lockout would have on that too. That's uh, that sucks. Like like when I'm you know fans are sitting sitting there going, well, pitchers are still going to throw. They're going to have guys to work with, but you really didn't. Like you didn't, or at least you didn't have the team guys to give you feedback, and that really can set people back. Yeah, I I mean I'm sure there was a lot of guys who were just you know doing their normal routine. And I, I think it, I would have been fine with it too if I wasn't trying to learn a new pitch. Yeah. You know, that that's the biggest uh, – between that and then I guess guys who have to do rehab, I think they got screwed the most. Yeah. Uh, you know, not really knowing what to do or if they're doing it properly. Uh, so it, it definitely was a hassle. I didn't enjoy it, but is what it is. Yeah, exactly. So let's go through the pitches. Like we've been talking a lot about it. Um, you, you said you do have a baseball, so that's a good first step. And I'll let you take it in the order that you that you want. Your fastball is kind of unique, too, at least movement-wise. Yeah, uh, so that's just – I mean, I, I hold a forcing fastball, uh, and it's honestly just the way my hand release. You know, most people are behind the ball when they throw it. I'm like this, you know. So I, I'm almost throwing a slider as my fastball. Uh which is, you know, why I tell myself I throw so slow. I, I say if I actually got behind the ball, I could be a mid nineties guy, oh, uh, no doubt. But, it, but it's what works for me. So it's like, as much as I want to look up and see the radar gun to say something high, you know, I would be fighting myself and fighting what has got me to the big leagues again, just by worrying about what people think about me. Did anybody ever try to change that? Because the one thing, so technology-wise, you get a rap soto, and you look at spin efficiency and stuff, or and and you're saying everybody assumes a hundred is great, like you want to get a hundred, but you can be really successful with low spin efficiency on your fastball too, either with seam shifted wake type stuff or just just generating movement, almost making it a cutter like Mariano did for all those years. Did anybody ever try to change you, or is it just it's always been you? Yeah, no, a couple of guys, you know, mentioned it because my spin rate was so high. You know, they're like, oh, if you get straight behind it, you're going to get like, so much carry. And yeah. uh, I was like, yeah, logically, that makes sense. But it could screw up everything else I do. You know, I, I think my hand started turning like this 
because as a younger player, I, I was a lefty lefty guy. So I was throwing so many sliders. I think I just slowly, you know, started moving my wrists without me knowing it. And uh, so it's like, same thing, like, yes, this could possibly work. And I could have a lot of carry and, you know, that four scene that just people, you could throw right down the middle and they miss. But I was like, this also works. So why should I change up something that not a lot of people can do? Right. Because whatever this hitter sees, I don't know. Even my catchers tell me they don't know how people don't hit it. But they see something and they think it's going to go a different way. And sometimes they swing under it. Sometimes they swing over it. I, I don't care as long as they miss it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's one of the good things about analytics. You can look at barrel rates and, and, and stuff and see like, hey, this pitch plays even though – the other analytics that you may look at, which is how much carry do you, everybody wants carry on their fast fastball, but because pitching is such an art, you don't necessarily you need to be like that little bit different thing. And if you you're right, if you changed it, it may not work as well with the rest of your pitches. Yeah, and my I, I look at my carry as well. Um, you know, I want mine around eight to ten, which to most people that's terrible. Like you don't want that at all for most guys. But to me, when mine's around that, it has a little more velo on it and it kind of gets way more swing and misses. If it gets below that, which it does sometimes, uh, it'll kind of turn into a true slider, which is still fine. You know, an 88 mile an hour slider, if I could place it, is still good. Uh, but I, I've learned that I have way more effect when my carry is around eight to 10. Uh, so I, I look at it, even though it's not as important to me. Um, you know, my horizontal movement is more important to me, but I definitely keep an eye on it. You know, interestingly, we always talk about how analytics mean that pitchers like Greg Maddox wouldn't be around today because everything's about Velo. Well, there's other analytics that would point out the fact that he would be really successful today and maybe he would be equally as valued. I mean, he clearly would be equally as valued. That's that's insane yeah. that there wouldn't be a spot for him. But the, when people think of analytics or, or radar guns, it's one piece of the puzzle. There's more than that that coaches are looking at and that teams are looking at when they're selecting players. Yeah, I mean, is it harder to get to the big leagues without Vio? Yes. But over time, teams will see it. It's just like, I mean, watching Grinky still pitch. He doesn't throw as hard as he used to, but he knows how to pitch. He's created new ways with, like, his EFIS pitches. And, uh, you know, a good pitcher is going to find a way. And, you know, Maddox was like that. He, he could pinpoint a ball. And so that would still work. That would probably work better now than what it did then, because now guys are going for more home runs and I think Maddox could exploit that even better now than what he did then. Excellent point. Because I think we've gotten into a point where hitters are all trying to do, or a lot of them are trying to do the same thing. And as a smart pitcher, you can exploit that. If you know that hitters are trying to do, like you have less guys just trying to, fewer guys trying to just make contact. Yeah. Um, and then you can use that that aggressiveness against them, you would think. Yeah, and I mean, that's something I try to use because I know what hitters see. I know that I'm in the dugout. I know the first question they ask is, how hard does this guy throw? Yep. So when I come into a game, they've just been seeing mid to upper 90s for the last, you know, however many innings, and they know 87's coming. They're going to be pretty aggressive. Like, usually if I throw anything close to the zone, somebody swing uh, because it's like BP again. Uh, so I try to take advantage of that, you know, whenever I can. And, you know, sometimes it works out or sometimes I give up a lot of hits really quickly. <laughs> Most of the time it's been working out, though, which is awesome. Well, let's move on to uh, some breaking stuff. Uh, well, the slider, which I guess everybody wants to know, is just a two seam uh, grip, but I throw it like a curveball. You know, most people throw a traditional slider like this, you know, where you're kind of behind the ball and go over the top. My slider, I throw, try to think my whole hand here, and I throw it just like my curveball. So, like, to me, it's easy because this pitch and then my curveball, which is like this, I have, I think the exact same thing. I just trust that they're going to move differently. What causes it to move differently? That, I don't know. <laughs> 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 to be honest with you, this is a, uh, this is, this one's a little above my head. It's honestly, the coaches just told me, trust me. If you throw it like this, 
it'll move and it does. Uh, it makes no sense to me how I could throw two balls the exact same way in my head. You know, they're a little bit different when I watch the slow-mo, but they're pretty close. And one of them moves pretty much, you know, side to side and the other one's almost straight down with a little bit of side. Well, help me with this. So when you're releasing it, what do you think about with your slider versus your curveball? Like, how does it come off your hand? How do you think it comes off your hand? I, I think they come off the exact same. <laughs> I know, well, you know, when I watch a slow-mo, my slider comes out a little bit more to the side. My uh -huh. curveball is a little bit more, you know, straight up and down traditional 12-6 look with my fingers on top. And so the C is a little bit different. So it's a little hand position wise or like, I when guess, but I, I literally think the exact same. I think get over the top, throw it and pull down right between my legs on both my curveball and slider. And not a different arm angle, not anything. You're just thinking, is it just the image in your head that's different? Like what is when, when some, when, when you're getting that sign, what do you think? Like, how are you, how are you making that go differently? Like there's gotta be something. It's just trust the grip uh really so uh, is it just I, a seam orientation that's different on yeah it? i think that's why the the whirly yeah is like a seam shifted slider uh yeah this is one uh you gotta ask somebody higher than me all right well let, it's let's... literally like i went with the uh dumb athlete you know hold ball throw ball well, show me what it's what it looks like when it's going really well when say you throw one that's moving 23 inches um horizontal break what is the what do the dots look like on the ball uh i think they would come off like this and it just kind of like spins almost like a one seam like sinker so like they would have a dot right here mm -hmm. for me and a dot right here so it's so, not even across from each other they're 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 across each other on the ball but whenever they're here they're supposed to be on this side and this side okay. pointing up like when I throw it, the dot would be pointing at the right hand of hitter's head. And then Got down the middle. Gotcha. So it is, it's right by the horseshoe. Is it, is it like on, is it in a clear, where, where would the dot be drawn on the ball? Uh, yeah, kind of on the horseshoe surrounding. It's a, it's a big ass dot. Okay. It makes it very clear for you. So yeah, it's a. Uh, and you want it know. kind of on, on that type of angle. Yeah. You want on angle. Because most guys are going to get that bullet, you know, where this part is just spinning right at you. And so it, it just angled way different. Gotcha. So the seams, it seams are, are creating the movement by itself. And on your curveball, then what are you doing? Curveball, same thing, but I think it's because of a different grip. You know, I'm, I'm having a four seam here. Mm -hmm. So you're just going to see just a four seam, just angled a little bit. Because my curveball, I'll get, I don't know, about, I think 12 to 15 inches of vertical breakdown and then about anywhere from eight to 12 horizontal, just depending on the day. Uh, but lately it's been more of a true 12, six or less, a little less horizontal, which I want now that I have the big horizontal break slider. Right. So you cover more parts of the quadrants of the zone and, uh, and you're aiming at for, for both of those pitches, where are you aiming your slider? Where are you aiming your curveball? Uh, so slider, like I said, with left-handed hitter, I would look, I would aim either here or actually at his head, just depending on where I'm trying to go with it for a strike. And then I move further on the plate as we go. Like the, the top yet bat first pitch, I was aiming right at him. <laughs> I could tell pitch, he ran away from it. And he's kind of far off the plate. So it was kind of difficult. Second pitch, I'll start like right on the white of the uh, left hand batter's box to try to end it up on the outside corner. Then once he swung at that third pitch, I'm starting almost middle of the plate, making it real far off. And then curveball, I look at the catcher's head, go over a little bit and about up a foot. So maybe subconsciously where you're aiming the pitch is also going to change how it releases from your hand as well. Like maybe there's a little bit, you're not trying to do it, but your, your aiming point is different, which means maybe you're maybe you're approaching it with your hand a slightly differently i don't know yeah i mean Could possibly be. like i said i'd still go through the visual in my head of what it's going to do so that might do it as well uh but yeah the actual way my mind thinks of how my arm is supposed to move 
is those two pitches are the exact same. And I just, uh, you know, you always hear this with like a change up, just trust the grip's going to slow it down. I just trust that those grips are going to make the ball move the way they're supposed to. Did you ever think you may be a Jedi or something where you can just <laughs> control it with your mind? No, no. Uh, trust me, there's some bad ones out there. You know, <laughs> everybody always asks me, you know, I would post bullpen videos uh, this off season, you know, just because there was nothing else to do. They're like, man, great bullpen. I was like, you missed a lot of pitches. I'm a really good editor. <laughs> Like everybody doing the recruiting videos, it's like, no, they don't always throw 95 miles an hour, like, and hit yeah. their spot. There's half of them, they're bouncing, but they're going to show you the ones that look really good. Yeah, I'm going to show you, you know, I threw probably about 40 pitches. I'm going to show you eight really good ones. Did you use like a rap soto or anything when you were developing this pitch, or was it mostly just the dots? Uh, it was the dots, but the problem, you know, I would throw in a rap soto a lot. The problem is the rap soto won't read that slider, and they let me know that. Uh, because it's like a seam shifted right uh, so I had to go luckily you know my old college rice university has a pitching lab itself uh, so as I was developing this I was throwing on the rap soda I wasn't getting any true data that I needed yeah you know, I thought I was in the right direction but I couldn't really tell so once I got to go on the track man in the pitching lab uh, it finally showed you know I think that pen I was throwing 17 and 19 inches so that was the time I got confirmation that I, it was starting to go in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and for, oh, I was going to say for folks out there, the Rapsodo takes it like a Magnus model, which is based on traditional physics, what we know, what we knew then, projecting based on the spin of the ball where the ball would end up, which will not take into account seam shifted wake, which is an effect that they didn't have when they were doing the algorithm. You actually have to have like the Hawkeye system, which optically measures it or track man, which will measure where, how far the ball actually moved versus basing it on a spin model. Yeah. So that, that was a little, you know, obstacle, but also at hitters that could stand in catchers telling me like, this is what it's doing. This is what it's not. Um, so I had the, the tools to get better, but luckily rice was there with the, the edutronics, like mocap, like everything just tell me what I was actually doing. Yeah. Like hitters feedback has to be great. Like they're sitting there going, Oh my God, I thought that was coming at my head and it ended up a strike would be the yeah. ultimate. That it is. And especially like, I'm lucky enough to work out a place where we have a lot of pro ball guys, uh, especially upper level guys. So I can, you know, it's, it's different as good as high school kids are, you know, to have around to use, like I work out in my local high school a lot they can't give me the same feedback as a guy who's hitting the big leagues can, you know, just because everything I throw there, they haven't seen before. Uh, so who, having that feedback helps. Who else worked out there? Do you, I mean, if you don't mind, you. Uh, you know, I guess the kind of bigger names people would know is like key Brian Hayes, uh, Shane Baz, uh, Austin Dean, uh, Canna, like we, we got a ton of guys, Ryan Hendricks, uh, the Reds, uh, so I, I think our facility is getting around over a hundred, you know, pro ball guys. And that's a DST. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Free, free ad. <laughs> nice. Nice. Is it Kopech over there too, or no? Uh, if he is, he wouldn't that much. So okay. They have about four different locations. Gotcha. Um, yeah. That's gotta be cool though. Getting that feedback from, from actual folks who know what they're doing, because I think most high school people would say no matter what it was, was, was kind of yeah. nasty at your level. But they, and they make you like I've thrown bullpens there and, and it makes you feel good because the catchers sometimes can't catch everything. So yeah. you get a little, you know, fluffing on yourself. But uh, no, like I said, uh, hitters feedback is the ultimate feedback because they're the ones you're going to face. And in the offseason, they'll tell you the truth. During the season, they'll lie to you. Are there any hitters that like you're still up there when you're when you're on the bump facing that you're like, wow, this is sick. I get to face. Shohei and I'm going to show him what I got and you know hopefully make him jump out of the way of something or um, are there still guys like that or is it just purely competing when you're out there now it's competing when I was first came up you know it, it was like that especially like the first time I got to face David Ortiz was like you know the oh wow moment but it was because when I came up a lot of those guys were people I grew up watching on tv you know so I was like a young kids fan of them uh you know now most of these guys are way younger than me 
So it's a little different, but uh, yeah, when I first came up, you know, Josh Hamilton, David Ortiz, like Beltran, like Beltran, like all those guys, you know, it was cool, especially I try not to look at any highlight or anything too much during the season, but once the season's over with, I'll kind of go back over my season and look at the cool moments to enjoy it. Uh, So at the end of the year, when I get to do that, it's pretty fun. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. Um, do you ever like, well, what do you want for your, your kids? Like playing wise today? What, what, first of all, boys, girls, uh, my oldest is a girl and I have two younger boys. Um, I mean, I, I encourage them to play They're They're playing little league right now. I don't like want them to have the pressure. I know they will have the pressure on it. We live in a small town. Uh, everybody knows who I am. Everybody knows who my kids are. Uh, they, obviously are expecting them to be really good and I hope they are but it's I mean if they are fantastic I'll share every tool I have with them if they want to do something else you know more power to them I'm not gonna this is a a hard game it's a stressful game it's a it's a different lifestyle so I'm I'm definitely not gonna force them to do it but I I will strongly encourage it yeah I find that that and this is where it differs from most normal fans that ha- or that have kids that play little league is they they tend to put a lot of pressure on their kids and most guys that have been there know when to back off and give them like i want it to be your life i don't necessarily want you to do what i do but if you do want to do it i'll help you yeah i mean I, i'm definitely not going to be uh my kids aren't going to be playing select ball anytime soon uh i'm a big fan of little league i think little league should be played and then you go play another sport you know, then you play basketball, then you go play tennis uh, because you just, a kid changes so much. No scouts are going to a 12 year old game. No 12 year old is going to become a big leaguer anytime soon. You know, a lot of guys I played baseball with at 12 that were way better than me stopped growing. I kept growing, you know, that was the difference. Uh, So I don't, I don't stress whether my kid's the best at something right now or, or not, because it's not going to matter in five years. Yeah. I think that's a great perspective to have because I see a lot of kids that end up falling out of the sport either because their parents put pressure on them or they felt pressure that they weren't good enough when they were young. And then they ended up growing into it and got bigger and stronger. And all of a sudden they're the stud and the guys that they were, you know, fearing or, or marveling at when they were playing against them no longer are, are like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like kids just grow different interests change. Um, you know, I guess the good thing for me is I don't have to live my dreams through my kids. I'm kind of living them. So I, I think that helps, you know, as bad as that sounds, some people do that, but it's just, man, I want them to have fun. You know, this is a fun game. Like I said, I, I make, I make my kids try every sport, you know, just because they're kids. If you ask them what they want to do, they're not going to want to do anything but play the iPad. Uh, So I do, kind of forced them to do activities but if they try it and it really like my son played soccer he hated it you know didn't understand it didn't want it I was like all right you know next year we'll play something else I think that's interesting because the other thing that I've told other parents is that when kids are growing up the one thing you've got to do is is give them the idea or give help them along the path because kids want to do what's good for them at that point. They may want to be a baseball player. They may want to be good at baseball, but they also don't understand necessarily the path to being good at baseball or being good at whatever it is. Honestly, it's good at school or whatever. You know, they want to get good grades, but they don't know what it takes to get those good grades. And at least laying out the path, saying, if you really want to do this, this is kind of the direction you go. Put in five minutes of work today. That's all you got to do at any sport. Pick it put in five yeah. minutes of homework or, you know, or extra work because if you do what everyone else is doing, you're going to get the same results by putting in a little bit more or uh, working a little bit smarter or differently. It may help you along the path and then go off and have fun, be a kid. Yeah. That's, that's what I try to tell, you know, my daughter's my oldest. Uh, she played T-ball and took three years off of, you know, softball. She didn't want to play this year. She wanted to play obviously a little bit behind because she hadn't played. And I would tell her like, Hey, we have to practice. And like, we can't just go to practice and that's fine. I was like, there's too many kids there. You're not going to get any better. 
and it took her a little bit to understand. I was like, but she loves gymnastics. I was like, don't you go to gymnastics and practice at home too? It's like, that's why you're better at that. I was like, so just like you said, if you, my job as a parent is to prepare them for life and, you know, they have choices and decisions, but like I said, I, when I was a kid, if my parents just let me do whatever I want, I'd play video games all day long. I wouldn't move. Totally and so agree. you have to make them do these things because later on in life, they're going to have to do it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I think being good at anything can help you be good at almost everything because it shows you the path that you need to do. And there's a deep learning thing that kids do if they're practicing on their own versus practicing at a group practice where they're just going through the motions. They're not really learning it. I think going off and playing by yourself, um, figuring out what works, doing what you did, which is I'm going to take a baseball. I'm going to go to a bullpen. I'm going to throw this and figure it out myself versus if somebody said, you know, just hold the ball like this and throw it. Yeah. No, I mean, you got to put in the extra work in anything in life if you want to be good at it. And I try to stress that. And I say things are way more fun when you're good. You know, yep. nobody likes sucking. Yeah, exactly. So who was the player that you looked up to growing up? Was there anybody that you sat there and said, boy, if I ever get to the big leagues, I want to be like this or that you're just a fan of? Uh, I mean, it, it changed. For a while, I thought I was a good hitter. So I watched Griffey. I was not a very good hitter. Uh, so once it kind of shifted to that, it went to two of the bigger guys at the time, Randy Johnson and Andy Pettit. Uh, obviously, way contrasting styles of pitching. Uh, I would much rather have had Andy – I mean, Randy Johnson stuff of, you know, the 100-mile-an-hour fastball. And 6'10", but, yeah. Yeah. But reality was there, like, me and Andy Pettit threw a lot more alike. You know, he wasn't – oh, he was a hard thrower, but not an overly hard thrower. He was more of a finesse guy, you know, creative movement. And uh, obviously the left-handed, I, you know, I just tend to go to those guys. Um, and his intensity. Like, do you have any of that intensity on the bump? Like, he was an intense competitor. Both of those guys were intense. Uh, yeah, I, the guys give me a hard time because I kind of talk to myself a lot on the mound. Uh, because I don't have the natural abilities of other guys do, I feel like I have to keep an edge to myself. If I relax a little bit on the mound, that's where I'm going to struggle. So, you know, when I'm out there, I'm talking to myself constantly, a lot cussing and sometimes I don't know if I'm cussing in my head or out loud. My mom and them kind of get mad at me. Uh, but I, I try to, I, I know that well, I hope is five minutes, but five minutes of my day is the most important part of my day. Cause if I'm out there longer than five minutes, it, it went terrible. Uh, <laughs> so I try to be as in, in the zone as possible during that time frame. What type of things would you say to yourself? You can bleep, you can self edit if you don't want to say them. It, it's a lot of like uh, calling myself names of a uh, weak character. <laughs> That's funny. Cause like I'll walk in, I, I mean, I trash talk myself all the time and I don't even go out there and do that. Like, I just get mad at myself and I'll catch myself sometimes saying it out loud. Like even looking in the mirror, like, what the hell are you looking at? Stop that. Um, I'll just talk to myself regardless because it gets me kind of fired up. Yeah, I, I, I think everybody should. Uh, you should be your own worst critic. You know, expect the, expect the most out of yourself. Uh, I don't ever want to be mediocre in life. So I try to make sure I'm not. Is it tough sometimes being your own worst critic? Because like some people, they're too, they're, they're so hard on themselves. They can't even function. They can't get out there and compete. You've got to at some point lose it to compete or maybe you don't, maybe you're that, I mean, some people, maybe that is the way they, they do it. Uh, I just think it's individual basis. Like to me, you know, I can have a, a scoreless ending, but if I give up a hit on a bad pitch, you know, I, I'm kind of pissed at myself for a while because whether it was a pitch decision or just the location, or I wasn't hundred percent all in on that. Um, I, I, I like being harder on myself than not, because I don't want to keep making the same mistake. If you keep making mistakes, you're like, oh, it's okay. I got away with it. You know, you're not going to get away with it eventually. So I, I try to correct it firmly in my brain, you know, not to do that again. Who is the funniest guy on the, on the team or strangest guy on the team just curious funniest or strangest uh, i mean wandy uh what? <laughs> we, we really don't even know what he's saying <laughs> right now him and the wise have this thing with me where they just talk to me in spanish 
Like, and I, I don't know very much Spanish at all, so I don't ever know what they're saying, but they talk to me like I'm a Latin player, and they just think it's hilarious. So I have no clue if they're calling me names or what they're really saying to me, but it's every day right now. Well, Isaac seems like a character, too. He's got nasty, nasty stuff. Like, that dude, oh, yeah. he's filthy. He's a little calmer than what you would think. Uh, he's real relaxed. He seems uh, happy. Like, he seems oh, like, a, like a happy dude. How can you not be happy? You watch him pitch. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> so, but no, they're they're all great. Uh, Higgy's got some good good stuff every once in a while. He he kind of looks at me like uh, you know Oscar looks at Michael Scott. You know, <laughs> thinks I'm stupid, but uh, I like messing with them. And some guys I just really play dumb with and say some ridiculous stuff just to keep them guessing. Were you part of the crew making fun of him? Um, you're probably not. You're probably in the bullpen maybe at that point where he threw the ball, Nestor's uh, immaculate inning ball into the stands. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Now, I was in the bullpen, but, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes he's just clueless. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny, like Cole with the uh, the asshole chant in the uh, in the dugout towards Biggie. <laughs> that was funny. Um so what other goals do you have for yourself or do you even set goals for yourself? It's probably winning a world series, right? You got to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's the obvious team goal. Last year was cool. Like it sucked. It was a one and done, but that was my first time in the big league playoffs. Uh, and honestly, to for it, I would rather have been at Yankee stadium, but for it to be at Fenway and the atmosphere they had was, you know, pretty awesome. Like I said, we, we got our butts kicked. Didn't enjoy that. But, you know, the crowd there was on their feet the whole game. They're loud. Uh, so just to be a part of that was cool. So that, that obviously sets the goal to try to make it further to the ultimate goal, the World Series. Uh, personal goal, man, I, I just try to make it to the next paycheck. Uh, I take it day by day, and that's about it. You know, I, I'm playing with house money at this point. I didn't expect to, you know, after that long stretch, I'm 35. You know, I would never guess I would be still in the big leagues. Uh, so it's like, just have fun. But 35 and just learned a new pitch that is one of the filthiest pitchers pitches in baseball. I mean, that shows number one, that you don't ever take well enough. You know, you're, you're always trying to evolve, which is a great trait to have as a, as a player. Um, but number two, what technology and coaching can do for a player, um, I think it's a credit to both you and the Yankees that that's, that that's happened. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it was, a. Uh, I, I had to kind of think about it when they offered to like teach me the slider because my slider has kind of been my pitch my whole life. And for somebody to say, Hey, you know, this thing that got you to the big leagues the first time, it kind of sucks now. Uh, it kind of made me take a step back and was like, Hey, whatever it takes. Uh, but man, with the technology now, I wish I had this, you know, when I signed and got drafted, uh, I, I think you're going to see some pretty amazing stuff over the next, you know, five or six years of just young pitchers, you know, coming with, the, you're already seeing it uh, with these young guys coming up to just the movement, the velocity, like they, they can just find everything. And like, I've done the, the motion capture stuff. You know, I, I'm at the point in my career, where I can't make big mechanical changes. What I do works. But, you know, even for myself, they found ways where I'm leaking in energy where, you know, I could change this to gain velocity here or there. So I think as a young prospect, if a team really dives into the technology and like the true mechanics of what he's throwing, I mean, the sky's the limit for those guys. Yeah, I think it's awesome. I think the future is going to be great. You see so many just dynamic young arms that are doing things that that's why I like doing what I do. Like every day I see something unique and it's so much fun. It's like, it's like opening up a box of chocolates and not knowing what's inside. Like yeah. little Forrest Gump <laughs> paraphrase. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's awesome. So it's the positive side of, of technology. Yeah. Is there any rule that you would change by the way, if you were going to change something um, in baseball? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> uh, like i think the drop third strike sucks like, I, I was gonna say the drop third strike is the worst rule in baseball the uh when the closer's out there where they still second base you know that's still an earned run if he gets a base hit um gosh there's there's just a lot yeah like to me if you're throwing something like you especially you you have something that's 
ridiculously nasty. The batter looks terrible swinging at it. And all of a sudden he somehow gets to first base because the pitch was too nasty for him to hit and too hard for the catcher to catch. Like that doesn't there, There's right. a lot of that. It's even like you'll get a wild pitch on a, a swinging strike and then, you know, and it's because it hit the plate and there's nothing the catcher could do about it. And right. all of a sudden the runner advances and, you know, that's an earned run. I, I don't know. They're, it's a dumb run. Intentional walk. It's not the pitcher's choice. Right. Right. Good point. <laughs> yep. That's no, another but, one. Uh, I'm I'm biased to pitchers, uh, so I am too. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, it's been great. Uh, I'm gonna let you ha- enjoy your day. And um, did if there's anything else like you want, if you ever need anything, any anything, let me know. Um, or if you if I miss one of your nasty pitches, which I probably won't, but if I do, <laughs> just send me it and or tell say, hey, you missed this one, uh, and I'll shoot it over. I uh, appreciate it. I'm sure you got Clay Holmes bookmark. I mean, it's just his fastball. So it's like everyone. Yeah. Like that, that's crazy for a guy to, he was under the radar. And then all of a sudden, like, I think Yankee fans took to him right away. The very first outing he had, they were like, what is this pitch? Like this thing's incredible. When we traded for him, the analytical department came up to me and Britain and said, Hey, go talk to this guy, show him the charts and just tell him, just throw strike, throw it down the middle. And, you know, it was the same, same concept they had with me. It was like, they showed us the chart, the heat map and said, look, this is your fastball. It's all blue. It's like, just throw it over that big square. And, you know, same thing he bought in and then, you know, he's awesome. This is a big change from where the Yankees were. I thought the Yankees were more of an old school pitching philosophy. And now they've totally embraced the, 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 good stuff that comes with new school stuff and piecing together a real staff of unique pitchers. Yeah. And, but the good thing is like, we have Harkey down the bullpen who's still that old school, even though he knows the new tech, he kind of keeps the uh, evenness of analytics and, you know, being a baseball guy. Uh, Cause he, he's way more into like reading the, you know, reading the game, reading the hitter. Uh, so he brings that, I don't know, that even kill right there. Yeah, you do kind of need to bridge the gap because not all old school was wrong. My dog's going to start barking at me. Oh, There's good. a vacuum outside. Uh, what, and, and also, is Garrett Cole as intense as he looks? Oh, yeah, that dude's a gamer, man. He, he lives and dies for this game. He prepares nonstop. Uh, so it, it's fun when he's out there. Awesome. Well, good luck the rest of the season. And, uh, and I plan on featuring you a ton. It's just so much fun to watch. And you just don't see stuff it. like that. It's it's really, really cool. Well, I'll try some more, all right? Uh, all right, man. Take care.